this does not justify what you've been up to, okay? It doesn't justify sending 100,000 troops to the border or sending cyber soldiers to sabotage the Ukrainian government or annexing territory, fueling a conflict that has killed tens of thousands of people in eastern Ukraine. No, okay? No matter how much affection you feel for Ukrainian heritage and its connection to Russia, this is not okay. Again, it's like the boyfriend who genuinely loves his girlfriend. They had a great relationship, but they broke up and she's free to see whomever she wants. But Putin is not ready to let go. I what know. the hell is wrong with you? I love you, Jessica. What the hell is wrong with you, dude? Don't fucking touch me. Do I love you, dude. World star! What's wrong with you? I do. Putin has constructed his own reality here, one in which Ukraine is actually being controlled by shadowy Western forces who are holding the people of Ukraine hostage. And if that he invades, It'll be a swift victory because Ukrainians will accept him with open arms. The great liberator. Like this guy's a total romantic. He's a history buff and a romantic and he has a hill to die on here. And it is liberating the people who've been taken from the Russian motherland. Kind of like the abusive boyfriend who's like, she actually really loves me, but it's her annoying friends who are planting all these ideas in her head. That's why she broke up with me. And it's like, no dude, that she's, she's over you. I what know. the hell's wrong with you? I love you, Jessica. I mean, maybe this video should be called Putin is just like your abusive ex-boyfriend. What the hell's wrong with you? I love you, Jessica. Oh, What's wrong with you? Okay, so where does this leave us? It's 2022. Putin is showing up to these meetings in Europe to tell them where he stands. He says, NATO, you cannot expand anymore. No new members and you need to withdraw all your troops from Eastern Europe, my neighborhood. He knows these demands will never be accepted because they're ludicrous. But what he's doing is showing a false effort to say, well, we tried to negotiate with the West, but they didn't want to. Hence giving a little bit more justification to a Russian invasion. So will Russia invade? Is there war coming? Maybe, it's impossible to know because it's all inside of the head of this guy. But if I were to make the best argument that war is not coming tomorrow, I would look at a few things. Number one, war in Ukraine would be incredibly costly for Vladimir Putin. Russia has a far superior army to Ukraine's, but still Ukraine has a very good army that is supported by the West and would give Putin a pretty bad bloody nose in any invasion. Controlling territory in Ukraine would be very hard. Ukraine is a giant country. They would fight back and it would be very hard to actually conquer and take over territory. Another major point here is that if Russia invades Ukraine, this gives NATO new purpose. If you remember, NATO was created because of the Cold War, because the Soviet Union was big and nuclear powered. Once the Soviet Union fell, NATO sort of has been looking for a new purpose over the past couple decades. If Russia invades Ukraine, NATO suddenly has a brand new purpose to unite and to invest in becoming more powerful than ever. Putin knows that and it would be very bad news for him if that happened. But most importantly, perhaps the easiest clue for me to believe that war isn't coming tomorrow is the Russian propaganda machine is not preparing the Russian people for an invasion. In 2014, when Russia was about to invade and take over Crimea, this part of Ukraine, there was a barrage of state propaganda that prepared the Russian people that this was a justified attack. So when it happened, it wasn't a surprise and it felt very normal. That isn't happening right now in Russia, at least for now, it, it may start happening tomorrow. But for now, I think Putin is showing up to the border, flexing his muscles and showing the West that he is earnest. I'm not sure that he's gonna to invade tomorrow, but he very well could. I mean, read the guy's blog post and you'll realize that he is a romantic about this. He is incredibly idealistic about the glory days of the Slavic empires and he wants to get it back. So there is dangerous momentum towards war. And the way war works is even a small little like fight can turn into the other guy doing something bigger and crazier and then the other person has to respond with something a little bit bigger that's called escalation and there's not really a ceiling to how much that momentum can spin out of control that is why it's so scary when two nuclear countries go to war with each other because there's kind of no ceiling the early sirens wailed in ukraine's capital once more but this was no rude awakening no one had been able to sleep. 
The latest Russian bombardments had hit yet more homes, injuring the very civilians the Kremlin promised had nothing to fear from what it calls a targeted attack on the Ukrainian military. As we make our way through Kyiv, we find volunteers now bearing arms to protect their country. We soon see signs of a battle drawing ever nearer, as well as those bracing themselves for a last stand. Of all the places to get a flat tire, Alina's family now caught between Ukrainian artillery and the Russian front line. Elena says the whole family is very afraid and can't now go back to their home. And this is why. What do you think of what Vladimir Putin is doing to the Ukrainian people? This is him, Elena's mother tells me. You can hear the artillery. That is outgoing fire from Ukrainian forces. That family has just left. The fear here is that very soon Russian forces will be making their way down here to take the capital. At the same time, Ukraine's president was trying to reassure a nation, pleading with the world to help them. For the second day, our cities experienced rocket and bomb strikes. Masses of tanks as well as airstrikes, which are similar to those which Europe has already seen during the Second World War and about which it said never again. But this is now how it is. It happens again. President Putin urged the military he was attacking to turn on their own government. I appeal to the servicemen of the armed forces of Ukraine. Do not let neo-Nazis and Ukrainian ultra-nationalists use your children, wives and the elderly as human shields. Take power into your own hands. Ukraine is under attack on many fronts. In Mariupol, in the southeast, destruction. In Sumy, in the circumstances still unclear, horror as a tank drives over a car. If the Russians succeed there, this will be one of the first neighbourhoods they come through, Podil. Today it looks like any other in Ukraine. This queue is for the pharmacy. Maxim tells us he hopes any advancing Russians would not harm him and his family. I think they don't take our like um, normal people. I think they have heart inside. They have something good inside. Elena, a grandmother, says Russian occupation would be a disaster. This is my city, the city of my parents, my grandparents. I'm not going to leave. And as for what she makes of Vladimir Putin... When a person is so inadequate, nobody knows what will come to his mind. This evening, the mind of President Zelensky was defiant. Speaking from the streets of Kyiv, he posted this message on social media. We are all here. Our soldiers are here, the citizens are here, and we are here. We defend our independence. That's how it'll go. Glory to our defenders, both male and female. Glory to Ukraine. Slava Ukraine. Tonight, there is overwhelming support for the men and women being asked to save their country. But there's also a deep fear the effort will not be enough. Man-made chemical weapons his secret agents deploy to keep Putin's enemies, wherever they may be, at bay. He was suffered so badly. Russia's current chemical of choice is the deadliest poison on Earth, Novichok. It's a sophisticated chemical, probably the most deadly chemical that man has ever made. A single egg cup full of Novichok could decimate an entire city and kill a million people. Tonight, we'll investigate Vladimir Putin's 20-year campaign of terror that seems to know no bounds and respects no borders. The wolf has tested blood and it's not going to stop it. It's now on a trail. And we'll explore Russia's latest attack, the poisoning of Putin's nemesis, opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Has Putin finally met his match? 
Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me tonight, Dr Robert Horvath of La Trobe University, who for 30 years has been researching the struggle for democracy in Russia. You start working for the enemy, then this is what will ultimately happen to you. Dr Trevor Findlay, who is a chemical weapons disarmament expert and principal fellow at the University of Melbourne School of Social and Political Sciences. It could be regarded as an attack on another country by, by Russia. And former diplomat to Moscow and a former Australian ambassador, Tony Kevin, who believes Vladimir Putin is the target of a Western conspiracy. I'd say something, it's absurd, but you talk the most amazing rubbish. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm, I'm going to hit you right up. Is Vladimir Putin uh, an international terrorist? We now have compelling evidence that at the highest levels of the Russian state, the use of chemical weapons was authorised. Terrorist um, is, is not unreasonable. Yeah, is it appropriate? I think it is. We clearly had in mind that terrorism could be a problem. What I don't think we had in mind was it would be the leader of, a, of one of the founders of the, the Chemical Weapons Treaty who would be involved in such a thing. Well, Tony, Kevin, how do you uh, sit with all of this? To call this man a terrorist is, to my mind, and with respect to my colleagues, grotesque and bizarre. There is, has been this characteristic treatment of Russia as outside the camp of the friendlies. And it's very easy to be misled into seeing the world in Machiavellian terms is made up of good people and evil people. It's August last year. And the cries of pain on this aircraft are those of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who has just been poisoned by Novichok. The hugely popular Navalny, described as the man Vladimir Putin fears most, was targeted by Russia's secret service, using the deadly chemical weapon that's been dubbed Putin's poison. I get out of this bathroom, turn over to the flight attendant and said to him, I was poisoned, I'm gonna die. As Navalny lay in a coma in a German hospital, barely clinging to life, Laboratories there, as well as in France and Sweden, confirm the chemical was Novichok. There is now irrefutable evidence that the nerve agent of the Novichok group was used to try to assassinate Mr. Navalny. It's just incredibly toxic. If chlorine is toxicity one, Novichok is 100,000 times more toxic than a molecule of chlorine. Novichok is an intensely powerful nerve agent. The tiniest trace of this poison can kill, shutting down the central nervous system, causing its victims to die agonizingly by asphyxiation. It was developed in secret by Russia to circumvent the international list of banned chemical weapons and was designed to be virtually undetectable by Western experts and inspectors. It's what's called a fourth generation uh, chemical weapon. Very much more technical than previous nerve agents. Uh, Novichok is, is a form of nerve agent, but much more sophisticated. It's almost undetectable. And it gives the Russians an advantage over, over the West. But Alexei Navalny is just the latest target of Vladimir Putin, the latest victim of his secret poison. The poisoning of Navalny is really significant because he's such an important figure in the opposition to Putin. When there's an attempt to murder someone of Navalny's stature, it, it sends a message to everyone about what the regime will tolerate. Navalny's survival and return to Russia, where he has been arrested and imprisoned, is fueling massive and ongoing protests. They tried to poison Navalny only for him to survive 
And now he willingly walks back to Russian jail so that he can inspire a democratic movement in Russia. And it has laid bare the brutality of Vladimir Putin's regime. The only thing outdoing the Kremlin's bottomless cynicism is their own horrifying cruelty. And his willingness to use banned chemical weapons at home and abroad. That is why today the EU has to choose the dictator Putin or the Russian people led by Navalny. The world first learned of Novichok's existence on March the 4th, 2018 in Salisbury. The picturesque city southwest of London, famous for its cathedral and nearby Stonehenge. On that March morning, terror struck. The first use of a nerve agent on European soil since World War II. The target was ex-KGB spy Sergei Skripal. Just a tiny amount of the deadly Novichok was sprayed on the door handle of his house. The Russian agents using a perfume bottle in which the poison had been smuggled into Britain. Just those few sprays turned Salisbury into a chemical war zone. Sergei Skripal had been a double agent for Britain's MI6, arrested, imprisoned, then allowed to leave Russia and settle in Salisbury as part of a spy swap. But Vladimir Putin never forgave him. Russia's Secret Service not only sent a chemical hit team to Salisbury to murder Skripal, but chose a time when his daughter Yulia was visiting. Unwittingly spreading the Novichok from the door handle of their house to sites around the city they visited, the Skripals were found on a park bench close to death. Now, anybody who, who opposes the Russian state, you know, expect to get your comeuppance. You know, Sergei Skripal, Putin had said, anybody who opposes him, you know, he would sort them out. And he, he absolutely did. Colonel Hamish de Breton Gordon is an internationally renowned chemical weapons expert and Salisbury resident. He lived through the attack on his home city. And it's almost the Russians sort of going, you don't know for sure it's us, but this is our marker and we can do whatever we want, wherever we like. And if we decide it's time to kill you, we'll do it, whether you're in Salisbury, in Russia or wherever. 